Hello and welcome to the Discrete Mathematics course in the Department of Computer Science at Tennessee State University. My name is Ali Sekman. I'm a professor of computer science here. Uh, today we are going to talk about predicates and quantifiers in discrete mathematics. Predicates will be very useful to draw conclusions from the propositions. And let's get started. All right, so this is COMP 3010, Discrete Mathematics. We continue to foundations of logics and logic and proofs. So far, we have discussed propositional logic and its applications. We also talk about propositional equivalences. Today, we are going to talk about predicates and quantifiers. We'll talk about existential and universal quantifiers. And then in the next lecture, we'll talk about rules of inference. And we are going to use rules of inference to uh, prove uh, different mathematical statements. So propositional logic is actually limited. I mean, for example, think about this. We have two propositions, all men are mortal. Socrates is a man. And then can we follow from those two propositions? Can we say Socrates is mortal? Can we have that proposition? Apparently we cannot, okay? So propositional logic representation will not be enough for us to draw conclusions. We will need a language that will talk about objects, their properties and their relations, okay? So, and then we are gonna use that later to draw inferences uh, uh, with, from the propositions. So what's the predicate or what are the predicates? Let's consider the statement X is greater than five, okay? So that's not a proposition, right? Because we don't know what X is. If we say 10 is greater than five, that's a proposition. But when we say X is greater than five, that's not a proposition because we don't know if it is true or false. So in this statement, actually we have a variable X, okay? That's the subject of the statement. X is greater than five is the subject. X is the subject of the statement, right? And then we also have is greater than five. This is a property that the subject of the statement, which is X can have. For example, X is greater than five is a property of X, okay? When I say X is greater than five, I can represent is as P of X and P denotes the predicate is greater than five and X is the variable. When I say P of X, I meant X is greater than five. Okay, so propositional logic, what we have discussed so far. Now we are gonna switch to what? Predicate logic. And we will be able to, we are gonna see that we can maybe draw some conclusions or some inferences using predicate logic. Okay, so predicate logic uses the following features. We will have variables X, Y, Z, and so on. We will have predicates like P and M, and we'll have quantifiers. And we are going to cover what quantifiers are. So we will need variables, predicates, and quantifiers in the predicate logic. So let's say here P of X and M of X are called propositional functions, okay? They are generalization of propositions. For example, when I say 10 is greater than five, that's a proposition. But when I say X is greater than five, I'm generalizing that proposition. And depending on the value of X, that proposition might be true or not true. For example, seven is greater than 10 is gonna be false, but 15 is greater than 10 will be true, okay? So the variables can be replaced by elements from the domain. For example, when I say X is greater than three, and if the domain is set of integers, okay, X will be replaced by an integer from that domain, from integers domain, okay? So propositional functions will become propositions when their variables are replaced by a value from the domain. Again, X is greater than five, okay? That's not a proposition, but when X is replaced by an integer, then it becomes a proposition. Three is greater than five is a proposition which happens to be false. Seven is greater than five is a proposition which happens to be true. And the domain in this case is what? The set of integers, okay? 
So the statement P of X is said to be the value of the proposition function P at X. For example, if P X is X is greater than zero, and if the domain is the set of integers, then what is P negative three? Replace X by negative three, negative three bigger than zero. Obviously this is what? False. And replace x by zero, zero bigger than zero is obviously false. And in this case, three, three bigger than zero or greater than zero is true, okay? So here what happened, we have the px, p of x, and we replace the value of x with some value, the, the, we, rep we replace the variable x with a value from the domain, then it becomes what? A proposition x greater than zero is not a proposition but negative three greater than zero is a proposition okay and the domain is denoted by u for example here the domain of x is what uh, the set of integers as we specify we always specify the domain depending on the domain uh, a, a, a proposition may be true i mean depending on the domain uh, the, the propositional function may be true or false. Okay, here you go. Now we have x plus y is equal to z is denoted by this propositional function. Okay, what does that mean? This says that this function, propositional function says x plus y is equal to z. That is the propositional function. So now the question is, what is the truth value when we have r2, negative one, five? All you have to do is replace x by two and y by negative one and z by five. So this says one is equal to five. Obviously this is what? False, okay? How about this one, three, four, seven? That means three plus four is equal to seven. Seven is equal to seven. And this is what? True. How about this one? X three Z. That means X plus three is equal to Z. Well, that is not a proposition. Why? Because propositions are declarative statements that are either true or false. In this case, we don't know if this is true or false until we have a value for X and another value for Z. So that's not a proposition. Okay, so let's talk about this. This is another propositional function. Okay, so let's see, for example, what is Q2, negative one, three. That means X is two, Y is negative one. This is three, three is equal to three. So this is true. Okay, and how about three for seven? We will have three, minus four equal to seven, negative one is equal to seven, which is obviously what? False, okay? How about this one? Similarly, I mean, this will be X minus three is equal to Z, which is not a proposition, okay? All right, so compound expressions, connectives from prop propositional logic carry over to predicate logic. What does that mean? So assume that we have a proposition function of P of X, and it means it denotes X is greater than zero, then what will be the value, the truth value of P3, P negative one? Well, what is P3? Truth value of P3, that means three bigger than zero, which is true. That means this is true. How about P negative one? That means negative one bigger than zero. This is false, right? So, but P3 or P negative one will be true or false, which is what? True, okay? So what this what does this say is connectives, this is a connective or from propositional logic, okay? This is a proposition, this is a proposition, carry over the predicate logic. This is the, the evaluation of propositional function at three, this is the evaluation of the propositional function at negative one. So you just apply the rules of what? Uh, connectiveness. How about P3 
and p negative one, this is true and false, which is what? False. How about p three implies p negative one? This means true implies false. What does that mean? If the premise is true, conclusion is false, the conditional statement is what? False. Okay. How about this one? P3 implies negative one. So P3 was, P3 is true, implies negative of P negative P minus one. So that means true implies true. Well, if the premise is true, conclusion is true, obviously the conditional statement will be what? True, okay? Yeah, expressions with variables are not propositions, clearly. For example, when I say X bigger than zero, that is not a proposition, right? Because we don't know the truth or falsity. Uh, just like this, for example, when I say P3, py well p3 three bigger than zero that is a proposition however py y bigger than zero is not a proposition okay so it does not mean anything to say p3 and py similarly px py implies py P of X is not a proposition, P of Y is not a proposition. However, when we have propositional functions like that, if we combine them with quantifiers, as we will discuss soon, then they become propositions, okay? This is a proposition evaluated at a certain point in the from the domain. And this is not a proposition, but when we combine them with quantifiers, as we will see soon, they will become, um, propositions, quantifiers, okay. Well, quantifiers are used to express the meaning of English words, including all and some, all and some. Get familiar with this. We are gonna use this all the time. What does it say? It's all men are mortal or some cats do not have fur. Well, you see here we have all men and here we have some cats, okay. So we are gonna quantify things. And we have two quantifiers very commonly used. One is universal quantifier. That means for all, and we use this symbol there. And existential quantifier, that means there exist. And we use this symbol there. For example, when I say for every X, P of X, this means right here for all X, P of X, this means for all x, we have p of x. However, here there exists an x for which we have p of x. And it's gonna be clear with some examples. Okay, so for all x, p x asserts p x is true for every x in the domain. So for every x, p x is true. But this means there is an X for which PX is true, okay? So it says that there is at least one X for which PX is true, or we can say there are some X's or there are some X for which PX is true. Here for all X, PX is true. Here for some X, PX is true, okay? All right, here you go again. This is read as for all X P X or for every X P X. That means for all X P X is true, for every X P X is true. For example, if P of X is X greater than zero and if the domain is integers. Now I have a question for you. Domain is the integers. That means I can pick uh, any, for example, if I pick negative three bigger than zero, this is false, right? But if I say five bigger than zero, that is true. But this means P of X is true for all X's. As you see, we have at least one X, which is, which contradicts with X bigger than zero, right? So therefore, when I say for every X, PX is true, I am wrong because there is an X 
and for example, here negative three, and that is not the case. Okay. However, if the domain is not just the integers, but only positive integers, well, for all positive integers, this is the case, right? For all positive integers, they are always bigger than what? Zero. Therefore, when I say for all x, p, x, that is correct. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and do the, this one. How about right now the domain is integers, but this time I say x is even. Well, when x is three, three is even is obviously false, but six is even is true. Even though x is even is true for some integers in the domain, it is not true for all integers in the domain. Therefore, we say that uh, for all x, p, x is not true. It is false. Okay, how about this one? This reads as for some x, p, x, or there is an x such that p, x, or for at least one x, p, x is true. Okay, that's what it means. Okay, let's check this similar to this example that we had before. P, x denotes x is bigger than zero and u is integers. Well, do we have at least one integer for which x is bigger than zero? That's the true, that's the case, right? For example, five is bigger than zero. Since there's at least one integer for which this is true, we can say that there is an x for which p x is true. So this is true. Okay, how about this one? If p x is x is less than zero and u is the set of positive integers. Well, is there any positive integer for which this is the case? Obviously not, right? If you pick any positive integer, any positive integer you pick, it is going to be bigger than zero. It cannot be less than zero. Therefore, there exists an x for px is true is false. It's a false proposition, okay? When I say there is an x for which there is an x for which p x is true is a false proposition, okay? Now, did you notice that? I mean, when I say that p of x is not, is not a proposition, clearly. However, when I say there is an x p of x, that is a proposition, right? I say there is an X for which X is less than zero, that becomes a proposition. Okay, here's another example. If PX is X is even, if PX is the predicate function, propositional function, sorry, it says X is even and U is integers. Well, there are some integers which are even, right? For example, eight is even, 10 is even. Therefore, if I, the proposition, there is an x such that p of x is true, is true because there's at least one x, okay? Also, there is sometimes this statement is used to represent there is only one and only one and only one x. For example, when I say there is x p x, this means there exists some x. There may be one, two, three, there might be more than one cases for which p x is true. For example, when I say x is bigger than zero and x is set of integers, the domain is integers, we have at least one x, but we have more than one x for which this is true, right? However, if I say there exists a unique x, this means there exists a unique x, okay? For example, if I say x plus one is equal to two, there is only one possibility for X, which is what one for this proposition to be true, okay? So this guy means PX is true for only and only one X, okay? So that's what it means. Okay, so let's talk about the properties of two quantifiers. The truth value of this proposition right here, or this proposition will depend on 
the proposition function p and also domain okay domain is very very important okay so let's talk about this u is positive the domain is positive integers when i say positive integers i guess you understand that the u is this set one two three and all the way to infinity that's the positive integers and when i say px is the statement x is less than two okay so let's talk about this x is less than two do we have at least one x for which this is the case? Yes, because if I pick one, one is less than two. So this is true. That means there is at least one x for which p x is true. So this proposition is true. How about this one for every x p x? Well, for x equal to one, this is true. But for two, this is not true. For three, that's not true. So that means that's this proposition is not true. Why? Because px is not true for all x's. So this proposition will be what? False. Okay. However, however this one now use the negative integers. The domain changed. Negative integers means what? Negative one, negative two, negative three, all the way to negative infinity, right? So that's the set of negative integers. Now, when we say x is less than two, do I say, when I say there is an x, px, is this the case? Yes. In fact, for example, negative three is less than two. There's at least one x for which px is true. That means this proposition is true. However, how about this one for every x, px? In fact, this is also true. Why? Because if you pick any negative integer, any negative integer is always less than two, right? So all the integers in this set are always less than two. So that means for every x, p, x is also true. Okay. So now u is another domain. u is three, four, or five. That's the set. Okay. And now the statement x is bigger than two. Well, for all x's in u, for example, three is bigger than two, four is bigger than two, five is bigger than two, right? So when I say for all x, p, x, obviously this proposition is true. Similarly, there is an x, p, x. This is also true because we have at least what? One statement or one x, which is the case. Okay, precedence of quantifiers. Quantifiers for all and for some have higher precedence than all the logical operators. What does that mean? For example, when I say for all x, p, x, q, x, look here, I have a, a propositional function. I have another propositional function. I have a connective, right? But this guy has higher precedence than what? The connective. So when I say for all x p x or q x i meant for all x p x or q x okay so please pay attention so this does not mean that for all x p x or q x this does not mean that okay so you have to be very very careful with parentheses okay here is an example. Translate the following sentence into predicate logic. Every student in this class has taken a course in Java. Well, every student in this class has taken a course in Java. We may think about two different domains. You, you might be students in this class. Or you might be all people. Right? So depending on the selection of you, your answer will be different. First, we are going to consider the domain to be the students in this class. Then we will consider the domain to be all people on earth. Okay, so that's what we are going to take. Okay, let's assume that you is all students in this class. 
So what does it say? And then let's say that we have a proposition function j of x that says x has taken a course in Java. Okay. So if I say for all x j of x, what does that mean? For any student, for any x in the domain. Well, my domain is the students in this class. That means for any student in this in this domain, if you pick any student in this domain or in this class, that student has taken Java. Okay, that's what it is. So that's pretty simple. For all students in the class, they have taken Java. That means any random student, if you pick any random student in the class, we know as a fact that that student has taken a course in Java. Okay. But now I'm going to change the domain. So let's change the domain. Now the domain is now the domain is all people. Okay. So now we have a proposition J of X. J of X will still be the same. Okay. It says X has taken Java, a class in Java, a course in Java. Then I have another proposition. X is a student in this class. Okay. So I have two propositions. Now, if I say for every X, let's see, let's start with this S X and J X. What does that mean? So what does this say? For any people, the domain is all people, right? Pick any person on earth in the world, pick any person in the world. This says that person is a student in this, is a student in this class and that person has taken Java. That's obviously not the case, right? If I pick someone from Japan, right? Somebody from Japan who has nothing to do with Tennessee State University, can I say that that person is a student in this class and that person has taken Java? That's totally irrelevant, right? So, but however, okay. However, if I say for every X, S of X implies J of X, that is true. What does it say? Pick any person in the world. If that person is a student in this class, then it implies that that student has taken Java, okay? So you see the distinction between this and this. Here is the domain is the students in this class. We say all, if you pick any student in this class, he has taken Java. Here the domain is all people. Pick a person in the world. If that person is in this class, then that will imply that that person has taken Java, okay? How about this one? Now, we will say some student in this class has taken a course in Java, some, right? So since it says some, I will use what? This one. And again, the domain might be the students in this class. In that case, I will say there's at least one student in the class that has taken Java, right? If the domain is, if the domain is the students in this class, I will say there is at least one student in the class who has taken Java. But if the domain is all people, what do I do? The domain is all people. That means there is at least one person in the world who is in this class and who has taken Java. Okay, that's what I will say. So if the domain is only students in this class, there's at least one student who has taken Java. But if the domain is all people on, in the world, there's at least one person in the world who is in this class and has taken Java. Okay, so this is what it is. Okay, now let's go back to go back to Socrates example. What does Socrates example is? We have two promises. What does this say? Okay, we have two propositional functions. Man, man of X is X is a man and mortal of X is X is a mortal, X is mortal. So now we say we have two prom premises. We have two proposition, two propositions from which we wanna draw conclusion, right? So the first pr premise is this one. What does it say? 
for if the if the domain is all people in the world pick a person if that person is a man that implies that that person is mortal okay so basically this says that all men are mortal okay and the second proposition socrates is a man see because i replace here x with socrates so this says that socrates is a man now my question given those two prim premises are we able to draw this conclusion can we say that socrates is mortal with the knowledge that we have so far no but now we are going to build a little bit more understanding of predicate logic and then at the end we'll be able to conclude that yes socrates is mortal so the conclusion here will be socrates is mortal that's the conclusion that we are going to draw in in a little bit okay so let's talk about equivalence in predicate logic we know the equivalence in propositional logic right so if you have a truth table and if two, two columns, if you have a compound proposition and if another compound proposition, if they turn out to be true, they turn out to be the, the same for all input combinations, that means they are logically equivalent. So we say that statements that involves predicates and quantifiers, for example, for all x, p, x, that's a statement that involves predicates and quantifiers. Why? For example, when I say for all x, p, x, this is predicate and this is what? Quantify. So statements that involve quantifiers and predicates are logically equivalent if and only if they have the same truth value for every predicate, for every predicate substituted into those statements and for every domain of disclosure. What does that mean? For example, look at this. What does this say? For every x, the negation of negation, like double negation of s of x is equivalent to for every x. So basically, this two, this is a statement, okay? That's a statement that involves predicates, right here predicates and quantifier, right? This is another statement that involves a predicate and a, a quantifier. So if they are equivalent, that means that regardless of what S is, regardless of what domain of X is, if this is always the case, if this is regardless of X and regardless of S, if this statement is equivalent to this statement, we say that those two statements are logically equivalent. In other words, okay, let, let me be clear here. So here, pick any X and any S and look at the truth value. Here, pick any X and any S, look at the truth value. If they have exactly the same truth value for any X and any S, then they are equivalent logically. And we'll see with an example. For example, here, for every x, px, and qx. Look at the parentheses right there. And now my question is this. If I have this, for every x, p of x, and q of x, is this logically equivalent to for every x, p of x, and for every x, q of x? That's the question that we are going to answer, okay? Okay, so in order to do that, that is if and only if, look here. Oh, not this one. Okay, here, if and only if, okay? So, uh, so that means if we have one statement and another statement, in order for them to claim that they are logically equivalent, if this is x, this is y, 
x must imply y and y must imply x okay because that's if and only if bidirectional or yes bidirectional condition biconditional okay okay so now i'm going to do this i'm going to say that first if this is the case does this imply if this is true does that imply that this guy is true that's the first thing i will check second i will check the other direction if this is true does it imply that this is true okay so it will be i need to pick any x for any domain and any p and any q uh, propositional functions okay so here show that if this is true then this is true that means this implies that and secondly if this guy is true this is true that means this implies that okay that's what we're going to do okay let's start with the first one let's assume that for every x px and qx is true okay so it is for any x right so that means there is an element in the domain let's call it lowercase a for which this must be true if for every x px and q of x is true there's a particular value there's a particular x there's a particular value in the domain that this needs to be true well if and let's assume that that is a okay and then p of a and q of a is true well if for example x and y if this is true this must be true and this must be true right so that means if this is pa and qa is true pa and qa must be true individually okay and right so pa is true and is qa is true for so that means pa is true and qa is true and a was random right for any element in the domain this must be true that means p of a is true and a was random that means for every x p of x must be true and q of a is true and a was random like any a that means for every x q of x must be true and then i take this statement and i take this statement and use end so i know that this is true i know that this is true so that means true and true is true so what did i do i started with this i assume that it is true and i concluded that this is true so this guy implied that this statement implied or this proposition implied that this proposition is true okay now we'll do second the other way we will start that assume this is true so this is my starting point assume this is true what does it say for every x p of x and for every x q of x is true again with the same logic when i say x and y if this is true individually each one must be true right so that means this must be true and this must be true for any x that means if a is in the domain p of a is true q of a is true because q of x is true for any x get a particular element in the domain let's say that's a so p of a and q, a, q of a must be true so since this is true this is true p of a and q of a is true right so since a was just anything or any element in the domain that means this must be true for all x so if this is true for any a that means for every x p of x and q of x must be what true so this is important this is an important conclusion okay 
So this parenthesis right there can be can be written as for every x p of x and q of x can be written as for every x p of x and for every x q of x. Okay. Negating the quantified expressions. Okay, here is, we have for every x, j of x. What does, remember this example, every student in your class has taken a course in Java. When I say the domain x is what? The domain is students in your class. Basically here, u is students in the class, in my class, okay? So when I say, every x j of x that means if x is a student that x has taken um, a course in java that means all students in the class has taken have taken a course in java okay so what is the negation of this negation is that it is not the case that every student in your class has taken java that means there's at least one student in the class who has not taken java right so that means there is at least one student in the in the class that has not taken Java. Okay, so the negation of this for every x j of x, the negation of it is equivalent to there is an x here. So this means for every student in in the class. Every student in the class has taken Java. This means there is at least one student who has not taken Java. And that's the negation. So I'm gonna use the books notation here. Okay, so symbolically, we say that the negation of every X J of X is equivalent to what? There is an X. So basically here, this notation and this notation are the same. The opposite of this is equal to, okay, I hope this is clear. How about the inverse of this? What does this say? There is at least one student in the class who has taken Java. There is a student in this class who has taken a course in Java, okay? So what is the opposite, is, opposite of this? It is not the case that there is a student in this class who has taken a course in Java. That means none of the students have taken Java, right? So we say that for every X, the inverse of J of X, what does that mean? For any student, if you pick any student in the class, that student has not taken a course in Java. So the opposite of this guy is this one, you see there? So we say that is equivalent to, okay. So here you go. This is the notation. The negation of there is an X, there is an X for JX is equivalent to for every X at the inverse of J of X, okay. So what did we see so far? Uh, Let's, okay, let's first go over this. The opposite of there is an X P of X is for every X P X. There is an X for which P X is true. This means there is an X for which P X is true. If I get the opposite of it or negation of it, that means for every X P of X is false. This means for every X P of X is true. That means there is an X for which P of X is not true. Okay, so let's always remember, also let's remember this for every X, P of X and Q of X is equivalent to for every X, P of X, for every X, Q of X. Let's not forget those, okay? So negation is this way, okay? All right. Okay, let's see. Some student in this class has visited Mexico. Okay. Some student in this class has visited Mexico. Assume that the domain is all people. U is all people in the uh, in the world. Okay. So this means there is at least one person in the world 
And that person is a student in this class and that person visited Mexico. So what does that mean? There's at least one student in this class who have visited Mexico, okay? That's what it means. So now I wanna negate this. I wanna have, what is the, what is the negation of this? Or what is the inverse of this? Some student in this class has visited Mexico, right? The negation is what? None of the students in this class has visited Mexico. Is that right? So, so let's go then. Well, actually we are not talking about negation here. This is just an example. So what does this mean? So in order to translate English, translate from English to logic, all you have to do is first determine the domain and then determine your predicate or the propositional functions, for example, here M of X, and then use the quantifiers to express the statement, okay? How about this one? Every student in this class has visited Canada or Mexico, okay? All right, so here U is all people in the world, okay? And then I have a proposition function M of X, X has visited Mexico, C of X, X has visited Canada, S is, S of X is X is a student in this class. So what does this say? For any person in the world, for any person in the world, if that person is in this class, that implies that that person visited Canada or Mexico, okay? It's pretty easy. For any student, for any student, so, sorry, for any person in the world, if that person is a student in the class, then that person either visited Canada or Mexico, okay? Okay, what does this mean, for example? We have C of X, X is a comedian, F of X, X is funny. And the domain is all people in the world. So what does this tell us? This says pick any person in the world. If that person is a comedian, then that person is funny, okay? So what does that mean? All comedians are funny, right? That's basically what it is. If a person is comedian, then that is funny. That means all comedians are funny. Okay, what does this mean? All people in the world are, okay, pick any person, okay, in the world, they are comedian, that person is comedian and that person is funny. That means all people are comedian and funny. Okay, what does this mean? There is at least one person in the world and if that person is comedian, then it is, if that person is comedian, then he or she is funny, okay? So what does that mean? There is at least one funny uh, comedian, right? Okay, first let's confirm. What does this mean? All comedians are funny. Every person in the world is either com are comedian and funny. That means every person is a funny comedian, in other words. There exists one person in the world. If that person is comedian, that implies that that person is funny. And here, there is at least one person, there is at least one person in the world who is comedian and funny, okay? That means there's at least one funny comedian in the world, or some comedians are funny. Okay. Here we have P of X, X can speak Russian, Q of X, X knows the computer language, C++, okay? Now let's write in, in, in predicate logic or let's write the proposition. It says there is a student at your school who can speak Russian and who knows C++. So that means there is at least one student in my class. The domain is the students, by the way, in my school. So you is students in the school, okay? There's at least one student in my school, okay? Who can speak Russian and also who knows C++. So that's what A is. There is a student in my class or in my school, sorry. And that student can speak Russian and that student knows what? C++. Okay, 
What does this mean? There's a student in your school who can speak Russian, but who does not know C++. There is at least one person in my school who can speak Russian, okay, but does not know C++. You see that? Okay. And of course we can use the books notation right here. Okay, my notation is exactly the same meaning, right? P of X and Q of X inverse. Okay, the same thing. All right, so now, so what is this? Every student in your school, every student in my school, that means for all students in my school, they can either speak Russian or they know what? C++, okay? Okay, and what is the last one? No student in your class can speak Russian or knows C++, okay? For all students in my school, okay? They cannot speak Russian uh, uh, or they don't know C++. So let's see if this is the case. No, actually that's that's not like that, sorry. And uh, we need to speak, we need to think easier uh, or simpler. For every student in my class, okay, it is not the case that they can speak Russian or they know C++. You get the opposite of it, it's okay. Very simple actually. Okay, let's translate those statements into logical expressions. We will use predicates, quantifiers, and logical connectors. No one is perfect, okay? No one is perfect. Let's put P of X, X is perfect. F of X, X is your friend. Domain are all people in the world. So what does that mean? No one is perfect. For any X in the world, it is not the case that that person is perfect. Okay, so here it is for any X, P not. So any person in the world, if you pick that person is not perfect. Okay, not everybody is perfect. Well, when I say every X, P of X, this means everybody's perfect, right? Get the negation of it. So that's what it is right there, okay? So this means basically everybody is perfect and I take the negation of it, that means uh, not everybody is perfect. Okay. And all of your friends are perfect. All of your friends are perfect. Pick any person in the world. If that person is your friend, then that person is what? Perfect. Okay. Pick any person in the world. If that person is your friend, then that person is perfect, okay? At least one of your friends is perfect, okay? At least one of your friends is perfect. So that means there is a person in the world that is your friend and that is perfect, okay? At least there is one person in the world, he's your friend and he's perfect, okay? Everyone in your friend, Everyone is your friend and everyone is perfect. Well, here, anybody in the world, if you pay, pick anybody, that person is your friend, okay? That person is your friend and that person is perfect, okay? And not everybody in your, not everybody is your friend or someone is not perfect, okay? Not everybody's, okay, first of all, if I say for everybody, that's my friend, sorry, friend. Pick any person in the world. This means if I pick any person in the world, that's my friend, okay? But what does it say? It's not everybody is your friend. So that means I will get negation of it. And then I have or, I will put or, Someone is not perfect. And there is at least one person in the world, okay, which is not perfect. 
okay so here that's equivalent to that okay let's think about this Lewis Carroll example let's have this two premises all lines are fierce some lines do not drink coffee and and some fierce cre creatures creatures do not drink coffee okay so what is the you what is the domain domain is all creatures okay so let's say that we have those uh, propositions, propositional functions, P of X, X is a lion, Q of X, X is fierce, and R of X, X drinks coffee, okay? So what is the first statement? All lions are fierce. If I, okay, all lions are fierce. If I pick a creature, and if that creature is a lion, then that must be what? Fierce, that's what it is, right? Okay. What is the second one? Some lines do not drink co coffee. Okay, there is at least one creature. Okay, if that creature is lion, okay, um, if that creature is lion, then that creature will does not drink coffee. No, and sorry, here we will have and. Okay, and then. The conclusion is some fierce creatures do not drink coffee. Let me put right here, okay? As you see here, for all, if you pick any creature, if it is a lion, then uh, it is fierce. There is at least one creature who is uh, a lion and who does not drink coffee, or yeah, who doesn't drink coffee. And the conclusion is, there is at least one creature who is fierce and also who does not drink coffee, okay? Nested qualifiers. Well, we will have a qualifier inside another qualifier, right? For example, here I say every real number has an inverse. What does that mean? That means for every X, okay, let's, let's do it this way. Assume I have P of X, and it means X has an inverse, okay? I can say for every X, P of X, okay? That's what it is. Well, what does inverse mean for X? Assume Y is the inverse of X. What does that mean? X plus Y is equal to zero. That's what it means, right? To be an inverse. So I can say that for every X, there exists a Y, such that x plus y is equal to zero. That's also possible, okay? So in other words, I can say that maybe I can define this p x y and y is inverse of x, okay? Then I can say for every x, there exists a y such that p x y that means for every real number x there is another real number there is a real number y for which y is the inverse of x okay or i can define this one as x plus y is equal to zero because that's what it means y is inverse of x means the summation is zero or i can say for every x there is a y for which x plus y is equal to zero okay so this is nested qualifier because this qualifier quantifier is within this quantifier. Okay. So what does this say? Assume that the domain of variables X and Y consists of all real numbers. That means our domain is all real numbers. Okay. What does this statement say? For any X and any Y, that means for any two real numbers, X and Y, X plus Y is equal to Y plus X. That's the case, right? If I have three, if I have three point five plus five point five, this is the same as five point five plus three point five, right? So here, this means for any two real real numbers, we can 
uh, uh, commute the, the, the commutative property. So x plus y is equal to y plus x. Okay, x plus y is equal to y plus x for all real numbers x and y. What does this say? Translate into English. Well, look here, the domain are all real numbers. What does this mean? That means x positive. What does this mean? Y negative, right? What does this mean? The product is less than zero. So for any, for a positive, for any, the product of a positive and a negative real number is always less than zero. That's what it means. How about this one? Uh, P of X, P X Y means X plus Y is equal to Y plus X. What is the truth value of this? For every X, what is the truth value of? So we are gonna look at this. For every X, for every Y, P X Y. Okay. So pick any two real numbers, X and Y. Is it the case that X plus Y is equal to Y plus X? This is true, right? Okay. How about this? For every X, sorry, for every Y, for every Y, for every X, P, X, Y. Well, this means Y plus X is equal to X plus Y, which is also true, right? The same. So basically what this tells us that for every X, every Y, P, X, Y is the same as for every Y, for every X, P, X, Y. So this is the same as this one. You can have commutative property, okay? You can have for every X, every Y, or for every Y, for every X is exactly the same thing in this case. Okay, so that's the conclusion. This one and this one are the same. However, now let's look at this. This is a little tricky. Q of X, Q X Y is equal to X plus Y is equal to zero. Okay, that is the propositional function. And now I wanna have the truth value of this proposition. What does this say? There is a Y. Okay, I'm gonna look at this. What does this tell us? There is a Y, okay? That is the inverse of, there is a Y such that X plus Y is equal to zero for all X. Is that possible? This says there is a Y, okay? For which there is a Y such that for all X, X plus Y is equal to zero which is not true, right? There's, this is true only for the negative of y. This is true, for example, negative y plus y is zero. But how about two y plus y? That's not zero, right? So there's only one x actually, okay? So when I say for q, x, y, this is false. How about this? For every X, there is a Y such that Q, X, Y is true. For every X, if you take any X, there is always a Y such that X plus Y is zero. This is true, right? If you pick any X, assume that X is 10, then I can pick negative 10 as Y and it is zero. If I pick 15 as X, I can pick negative Y. There is a Y which is negative 15, this is zero, okay? So that is true, see? So what does this tell us? This tells us that this one is not the same as, so you cannot switch them, okay? Okay, what does this mean? For every X and for every Y, P of X is true. For this one, 
for every x, there is a y for which p of x is true. This means for some x, for some x, or there is an x such that p x y is true for all y. Here, there is an x and there is a y such that p of x is true. There is a y, that means there's a pair of x and y for each p of x is true. Here, for all x and y, p x of it, p x y is true, okay? Let's not get confused with that. Here's an example. You are the real numbers. P x y is the propositional function. X times y is zero. What is the truth value of the following? For example, well, I have everything together. What does this mean? For every x and y, p of x. Is that true? If I pick any real numbers, any two real numbers, is the product zero? Obviously not. For example, three times five is 15, which is not zero. So if I pick any two, any real integer, real numbers, that's not the case. The answer is false. How about this one? For any X, there is a Y for which this is true. If I pick 15, if I multiply it by zero, I get zero, right? As you see here, for any X, for any real number, zero, if you multiply any real number by zero, you always get zero. That means there's at least one Y. In this case, Y is equal to zero, okay? How about this one? There is an X such that there is an X such that for every Y, P X of Y is zero. For example, zero times any Y is zero, right? So that means there is an X, which is zero, for which if I multiply that X with any Y, I always get zero. So that's true. How about the, 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 the last one? There is an X and there is a Y such that X times Y is zero. Well, for example, zero times five or, okay. Um, yeah, so, or zero times zero is zero or 15 times zero is zero. So that's obviously true. How about this one? You, the domain is again, the real numbers, okay? And then this time the function is X divided by Y is equal to one. So let's look at this. This says for any X and Y, for any two real numbers, this is the case, which is obviously not true, right? For example, 15 divided by five is three, which is not equal to one. So this is false. What does this say? For any X, there is a Y for which this is the case. If I pick any X, if I pick any X, uh, let's say that I have 15 for any X, there is a Y such that, well, that's unless X and Y are the same, right? 15 divided by 15 is zero is one. So unless if I pick X, unless Y is equivalent to X, this is not the case. There is an X such that for every Y, this is the case. Well, if I have an X for, for example, I have Y, can I find an X? For example, if Y is 15, X must be 15. If Y is 25, 20, X must be 20. So there is not a, there is not an X for which X divided by Y is equal to one for all Y. So that's false. And this one, there is an X such that there is a Y for which P of X is true. Well, this is little, I mean, when you look at this two, actually this little contradictory uh, unless X and Y are the same thing. So for example, if I have X 15 and if Y is 15, yes, this is one, okay? Translate the statement, the sum of two positive integers is always positive, okay? So for every X and for every Y, of course, the, the domain is integers, okay? Integers, positive integers. In other words, one, two, and so on. For any two positive, in, well, sorry, the domain is integers. 
let's say that the domain is integers z in that case for any x and for any y if x is bigger than zero and y is bigger than zero this implies that x plus y is bigger than zero that's what it is for any x and y if x is positive if y is positive then it will imply that the sum is positive okay translate the statement every real number except zero has a multiplicative inverse every real number so x the domain is what real numbers for every x okay if x is not zero if x is not zero uh, that will imply that there exists a y for which x y is equal to one okay here you go for any real number if that real number is not zero that implies that there is a y such that x y is equal to one that means for any x if x is not zero, there is a multiplicative inverse, okay? If a person is female and is a parent, then this person is somebody's, someone's mother. So let's translate this to English or this English to, from English to propositional logic with quantifiers. All right, so here you go. So I have a propositional function f of x, x is female, p of x, x is a parent, m, x, y, x is mother of y, okay? So here is what I have. For any person, if that person is female, and if that person is a parent, that implies that there exists another person who's child of that person, see? For any person in the world, if that person is female and if that person is parent, that implies that there is someone else in the world, okay, who is the child of X, okay, X is mother of Y. So that's what it is. How about this one? Translate this statement here. C of X, X has a computer. F, X, Y, X and Y are friends, okay. And the domain for X and Y are all students in the class, in your school, sorry. So pick any student in your school. That student either has a computer or there is another student in the school who has a computer and who is a friend with this person. So this tells us that all students in the school are I, they either have a computer or they have a friend who has a computer. Okay. Well, let's translate the statement. Here, F, A, B means A and B are friends and the domain of X, Y, and Z are all students in the school. There is one student in the school, okay. There is at least one student in the school. You see that there is one student in the school such that any, if you pick any two other students in the school. So there is someone in your school for, for which if you take any two other students, either, okay, any other students. And if this student is a friend with X, and this student is a friend with X and Z and Y are not the same. That implies that, okay, so this means, it's very clear. There is a student in the school, there is a student in the school who is friends with, with all other students. Okay. There is a student in the school. If that student has two friends, those two friends are not friends of each other. 
Okay, so there is a student, and none of whose friends are also friends with each other. That's equivalent to what I just said. The sum of two positive integers is always positive into a logical expression. The sum of two positive integers. Actually, we did that. Here, actually, we already did that. For two integers, if they are positive, that implies that their sum is also positive. Negating nested qualifiers. This is gonna be tricky. There is a woman who has taken a flight on every airline in the world. First of all, let's express this. This is a little tricky. Okay, so look here, PWF. This is the propositional function says W has taken flight. Okay, first of all, W, domain for W is all women, okay, in the world. And the domain for F, all airline flights, all airline flights, and domain of A, all airlines. Okay, the set of all airlines. So let's remember this. And what does it say? PWF, W has taken F. That means W has taken flight F. QFA, F is a flight on airline A, okay? So what does this tell us? There is a woman, there is a woman, W, okay, for all airlines such that for airlines, there is at least one flight, there is a woman, and if you pick a random airline, there is a flight in that airline, there is a flight such that this woman has taken that flight and that flight is in that airline. So there is a woman, who has taken at least one flight from each airline, okay? That's what it is. Actually, here it is. There's a woman who has taken a flight on every airline in the world. There's at least one woman for which, such that for any airline, there is a flight this woman has taken and that flight is in that airline. So now I wanna get negation of this in the next slide, okay? So what does this say? There does not exist a woman who has taken a flight on every airline in the world. So I wanna get the negative or negation of this. Remember, we have the statement, okay? So here there's a woman such that for any airline, there's a flight that this woman has taken and that flight is in that airline. So I'm gonna get the negation of this, okay? This is pretty easy actually. So here, this will go here. Remember this, the negation of existential qualifier is all, and negation of all is existential qualifier, okay? So don't forget this, we did that before. Okay, so here, uh, I will get the inverse, this, sum becomes all and negation goes here and then all becomes sum negation goes here and then sum becomes all negation goes here so i'm going to get the negation of that and that means i'm going to get the negation of p negation of q and also and becomes what or right so that's what it is what does it say for all women in the world, there is an airline, okay? There is an airline such that all flights, there, for any woman in the world, there is at least one airline for all flights. This woman has not taken that flight or that flight is not in this airline. So this is equivalent to there is a woman there does not exist a woman who has taken a flight on every, every airline in the world, okay? So that's what it is. For every woman, 
there's an airline such that for all flights, this woman has not taken that flight or that flight is not in this airline, okay? So that's equivalent to this statement right there. Well, uh, this concludes uh, this lecture uh, on the predicate and quantifiers. These are pretty important. In the next lecture, we are gonna talk about the inference, rules of inference, and I'll see you in the next video.